Hello and welcome to Lexitecture, a podcast about word origins and histories. My name is Ryan, and in each episode my friend Amy and I bring a new pair of words to share their stories with each other and you. You can find our past episodes and the occasional blog post on our website at lexitecture.com, follow along with us on Twitter and Facebook at Lexitecture, and if you really like what we do, you can support the show at patreon.com slash lexitecture. Today's episode, Cheesemonger Parade. I also feel like, like I, th- I sort of, I sort of want to ask a question of you, the listenership, and and the world. Like, uh, okay, is there actually a thing whereby, like, is there a reason why I'm so bad at time? <laughs> Like, do I have a disability? Like, it's an identified like, challenge yeah, that people have yeah. that's been written is, down is it somewhere. A thing that's like, you know, I have dyschrono... or dyschronia or something like, dyschronia, like dyslexia, that's what but for time. Called. Yeah, that's that's that was kind of what I was using as my as my model there, because like, you know, the ability that human beings have to go, I need to do a thing, and it's going to take about this length of time. Right. Yeah. No. <laughs> to, to give you some context here dear listener um about 45 minutes about an hour ago now uh i had about 45 minutes until ryan and i were, were scheduled to to get online together and so i thought okay I, oh my computer needs an update i'll do that now it won't take long right of course what not was I thinking <laughs> Like, what, just what was I thinking? But I, it, it doesn't just happen with things like that. Like, you know, a, a string of errands that need to happen in several different places or, or even just I'll meet you somewhere at this time. Like, I, I, yeah. I'm honestly beginning to think that maybe there's something actually wrong. Well, because there's, I mean, there's dyslexia, which is what we're sort of basing dyschronia on as far as... Dyscalculia? Is the numerical See, version of dyslexia? I thought it was dysnumeria, but maybe dyscalculia. Dyscalculia is how I learned it at the hmm. teaching college. As in the same effect as dyslexia, like mm. where numbers kind of invert themselves to you and you, you have trouble keeping yeah. numbers in the right order and such, yeah. right? Yeah, they just don't make sense. Like, I think I have a spot of that. Oh, really? Or maybe a, maybe actually a bit of dyslexia, but particularly numbers, I have to like read them a few times sometimes. I, so I think for some reason, I can hold words in my head very easily. I can remember yeah. song lyrics and quotations and that sort of thing, but a number with more than about three digits in it, fucked. Completely fucked. <laughs> right. Like I, I'm quite glad that I live in a world where no one has to remember phone numbers anymore. <laughs> See, phone also, numbers were actually a, a, a particular thing of mine. I sort of lamented the fact that technology robbed me of the the very few natural advantages i had over the, the rest of my species like i was pretty good i was always really good with directions and i was pretty good at remembering phone numbers and oh, then no. i grew up and then those two things became utterly irrelevant it's like i might as well be really good at winding cassette tapes now like it just doesn't I, matter uh, i am the, the the exact polar opposite of you as a human being and <laughs> i am very glad now that i do not have to try and pretend i'm good at those things anymore because i'm not so I just ask the small box and usually everything works out pretty well. Yeah. But um, it, it is quite funny when, you know, when, when you ask people to rely on their before time skills. Like when you say, <laughs> oh, do you know anybody's number? And they're like, no, do you? What? Yeah. Like, it's just not a thing. It's not. But um, yeah, the, the, the Great Collapse is going to be interesting for lots of reasons. But th- that's going to be one that will make me laugh a lot. <laughs> Just a bunch of people bumping into things, not really knowing how to get anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Good times. Yeah. Good times. Um, before we get to the wording, we have a new Patreon subscriber to thank. How delightful. And her name is Allison. And thank you very much, Allison. You are, along with your Patreon compadres, awesome. Allison, two of my best friends in the world are called Allison. I can only take from this the, the idea that all Alisons are excellent and your excellence uh, I'm, I'm glad that your excellence has manifested itself in this particular way 
as Ryan says, we are very grateful to you and to all the other Patreon people that support us and remind us that this is a good thing to do and, and seem to enjoy our doing of it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And on that note, I am planning on, I, I am, I know I've said this before, I am planning on actually doing the thing, things necessary to get us an actual post office box because I do still thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy the idea of people having a chance to send us postcards from here, yeah. hither and yon. Hither and, so and cool. yon. And the Patreon people help make that a reality because that is not a thing I could afford to do otherwise. <laughs> yeah, so. cool. Thank you again. We yes. really do appreciate you. Uh, right. To the words. Shall, shall I or shall you? Uh, I, I really don't mind. Do you, do you want to jump right in or will I I'll go jump. I, I, I'll jump, jump right in. Jump on in. So this word actually, I started thinking about this word um, because I started thinking about a different word. And I started thinking about that word because I saw a word that was made up based on that word. Anyway, I was reading this book called The Starlight Barking. I don't know if you're familiar with it, if I you've ever not. heard of this. No. So this is, and I, I had not heard of it before someone actually pointed out how, how bonkers this is. Starlight Barking is a sequel to The one, the 101 Dalmatians by Dodie Smith. Oh, okay. The book upon which the Disney film was based. I didn't know that it was a book. I mean, I, it's been The 101 think about Dalmatians it. was a book? Yes. Oh, okay. I I did know that. I could have told. I could even have told you that Dodie Smith wrote it, but I don't know anything more than that. Yeah. So, I, like, I mean, if I had thought about it for any length of time, I probably would have been like, "Well, I, I'm sure it was," because original films were not really in Disney's wheelhouse <laughs> in in that era. So, I assume it came from something. But despite the fact that there have been two different major movie adaptations about 101 Dalmatians, and despite the fact that both of them have had sequels of their own. Neither oh. of the sequels have anything to do with the starlight barking because the starlight barking is, in a word, bananas. It's, it's such a beautiful title. It 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 is. It's it's quite a lovely book. Uh, I read the Hundred One Dalmatians and then I went on to this one, and it's uh, it's just it's it's a wild it's a wild book. It's like a science fiction uh, metaphysical. Uh, adventure featuring dogs where the rest of the world is asleep and it's thanks to Sirius the dog stars come down to try to take all the dogs to another planet like it's it's bonkers oh yeah they can all hear each other's thoughts and one of the kids of Pongo and Mrs. becomes the, the prime minister and anyway it's like a, it's yeah it's wild at, so, at this point I sort of feel like we're at a party in about 1997 and you're really high and I'm going, yeah, yeah, I mean, sure, that, that, that could happen. Yeah, why not? <laughs> why not? Anyway, so in the middle of this bonkers book, there's a, a huge procession of, job, of uh, jobs, of dogs, and the narrator refers to it as a canine-cade. Canine-cade. Oh, that's nice, isn't it? I was like, that's lovely. And then I was like, that's, that's, I love that. That's awesome. Obviously from Cavalcade. Yeah. Hey, wait. Cavalcade that is an interesting is word. An interesting word. And then so, and then I looked from that and then I was like, well, I wonder if that has any, anything, like if, the, if, if Cavalcade and Parade on account of they end the same way, mm -hmm. I wonder if they have anything to do with each other. So I actually kind of cheated. I looked up both. And so my word this time is actually Parade. Oh, so okay. that was my long introduction to get us to the word parade. <laughs> um, Which is uh, entirely fitting. There should be a queue of words involved. Well, yeah, I would think so. So, I, and also I wanted to bring up the starlight barking because it's The starlight barking. Yeah. yeah. Highly recommend it. A very short read. The but LSD years. One. And also, if you haven't actually read 101 Dalmatians, it's quite good. Well, I, I was just, I just automatically assumed that the Disney feature will have very little to do with the original book because I've read many Poppins. Right. Yeah, it's it's actually not as far off as you might think. Okay. But there are some interesting ways in which it has diverted. And that's kind of That's what was cool to spot, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of cool. So, um, parade, it's parade, tell me more. Anyway, back onto the thing. So the earliest OED citation for parade is from 1649. Okay. And it is in a specifically military context. So the assembly of troops for inspection or display, doing fancy pants maneuvers all in startling unison 
on a big uh, empty square of concrete, that kind of thing. <laughs> Startling unison is, is uh, amusing me greatly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and then in 1656, the OED has a citation of it being used more generally as show, display, ostentation, or an instance of these. Okay. So it's only seven years later, and so it's it would be hard to tell whether which one like which one came first in that case because they're so close except that the pre-english origins which were from f the french and latin side of the family most recently also had a specifically military sense okay so the, the, over the the preceding sort of century the french word parade specifically meant troops on display like that right okay that exact context so that makes me think okay well then that's where english got it but the further back you go in french you also get to sort of mid 15th century in middle french uh, where it did it did go back it was a general meaning an action of displaying something in order to make it appear valuable or showing off Okay, so, so you, very hard to tell if the chicken or the soldier egg came first. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So it, it seems like when it came into English, it had that specific use and then went back to being generalized, sort of in this pleasing full circle kind of way. Yeah, it's pleasing. Um, now, the, the sort of structure of the word itself is, I'm happy to report, a connection between cavalcade and parade. Oh, that is good. So well I, I had originally thought, I, I had originally obviously leapt to like para, as in parasite, as in sort of something off to the side of, or Parabola, along with all the, that sort of, yeah. Yeah, that P-A-R-P-A-R-A that -A -A -R -A kind of prefix. Um, but it's not that. It's the A-D-E is the suffix, that the aid bit is the full suffix. Oh. As you can see in cavalcade. So when you look up the aid suffix in the OED, you get two different uses, which will make sense as soon as I kind of say them and give some examples. So one is forming nouns denoting an action or activity, especially a protracted one. So basically nouning verbs. Okay. If you want to noun a repeated or elongated or lengthened procedural verb, you can throw a on the end of it and so uh frequently it says frequently by extension a body concerned with this or in some cases denoting the result of an activity or having collective force right so the examples are a cannonade okay or a blockade right and masquerade ah okay cool which is kind of pleasing and yeah, so cavalcade so. fits into this category with the first bit meaning horse obviously like cavalry yeah cool so the second use is form <laughs> forming nouns denoting drinks made from the fruit, etc., denoted by the first element as orangeade, gingerade, cherryade. Oh, of course. I had completely forgotten that that was a thing. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and that's, and that's sort of that one, which, which I was surprised to find that in the OED, like... That seems, now I realize these are very, very old words, but it still seems a little hip for the OED to have that in there. <laughs> I, um, I am wildly curious about the etymology of that particular aid. Mm -hmm. Why is that a thing? I've been wondering <laughs> about this since I was a child, quite literally, like orange aid and pineapple aid and, you know, all the other aids. Um, why? Why is that? Yeah, I don't. I mean, my my initial sense, and this is pure guesswork, is is that it is sort of connected to the first one. Like instead of being denoting an action, you know, you go from block to blockade and mask to masquerade. But you also have like a cavalcade is taking a noun and and sort of denoting a collective effort. You can't have a, a one horse does not a cavalcade make. And one orange does not an orange aid make. Bingo. So you need the collective <laughs> efforts of the juicy, I juicy feel like innards. This is the folkiest of folk etymology. <laughs> yep, I'm here for it. Do you have an orange jumper I'm on? <laughs> and if not, why not, damn it? So, 
So that's that's my folk etymology guess as far as how those two things are connected. But I don't know. Yeah, but it's interesting that there's the, those two different ways. Yeah, of course. That's that's very cool. Now the in the case of parade, we've got the suffix down pat. The first bit, the par, is essentially just the verb to pair, as in a paring knife. Oh, okay. Or that wordle result that like pissed off the entire world when nobody got pairer right. Which is oh, also must, hard to say. I must have but, missed that one. That would have given me the absolute fury. Oh yeah, no, everyone like, and somebody posted, you know those um, the 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 visualizations of Google search results frequencies. Oh, yeah, yeah. Google search frequencies. <laughs> In one day, the word "pairer" became a Google trend. Like it was like hundreds of thousands of searches for this word <laughs> that day. Hundreds so the guy, of thousands and the guy, of furious searches. Of furious rage googling. <laughs> So you pair of I would, stupid I word. would like Google Analytics to tell me how people feel when they search for these words. I think that would be a really, <laughs> yeah. really useful uh, entry, a really useful parameter for them to include. Just a little tick box that says "searched in anger." <laughs> That's the one that you click off if you want to find those ones. Um, <laughs> Sorry, so, continue. <laughs> so yeah, so it's basically just the the verb is pair, which at first blush is. It raises more questions than it answers, I think, because well, I was like, well, that doesn't make any said, sense at all. When you said pair, I thought, oh, I, okay, as in two things, a pair right. aid, but but no, pair as in to scrape a peel off something or exactly, cut it down yeah. smaller so, or thinner. Okay. So then I looked up pair because I was like, obviously pair has either an alternate or yeah. a obsolete or historical meaning that I am not aware of because I just think of it as cutting small pieces off a thing that's already fairly small. Yeah, sure. You know, yeah, trimming something or cutting slices or peeling something, that kind of thing. But uh, the verb pair goes back to 1300 in the OED and it originally meant to trim an object by cutting off projecting irregular or superficial parts to cut close to the edge so as to make even or neat, to cut away the outer edge or inside of something in thin layers, sliced slices or flakes, etc. And that's so. Oh, that that's that's just awesome. Isn't that neat? So, so cool. It 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 lost the word pair. Lost that sort of unifying intent meaning to it, mm -hmm. and just kept the you're cutting off small chunks of a small thing. But originally, the, the, the chief object of, the chief goal of when you're pairing something is not the bits that come off, it's the bits that remain and that they're unified and, and a smooth edge to them and stuff. That's so cool. And I think that's, I think that's actually the difference for me that it, it just occurred to me as I said that, is that now I think when you pair something, you're, you're focused, you're looking at what gets cut off. Yeah, yeah, definitely. If someone's using a pair, I've got to just use a paring knife on this apple. You're not looking at the apple. You're watching what's happening to the bits that are being removed from the apple. And so that might be, that's where the switch was. And so now this makes all the sense in the world. Yeah. Because if you want to show off, you got to trim all the bits that aren't in startling unison. And <laughs> so to get everything just so for the purpose of a parade is an act of pairing. And so that's where that is. So that's kind of the, uh, so a repeated or protracted instance of the old, I'm going to say mostly obsolete sense of pairing gets us the word parade. And um, if, if I might be so indulged, I decided to look up what Smith had to say about parade. Oh, delightful. So he lumps... This is from uh, a book called Synonyms Discriminated, for those who are not aware. Oh, uh, you've heard us if you're not to aware, before. welcome got, to the wonderful yeah, world of Smith. Definitely. So Charles Smith is one of the most difficult names to Google and find the specific person <laughs> you're looking for, but that's the dude that wrote this. He was a priest, I want to say the end of the 1700s, and he wrote a book that was like a reverse thesaurus where he just talks about how things that appear to be synonyms or are often called synonyms, are not actually synonyms. And here's how they're different. And he writes fairly beautifully. And it's an interesting little uh, little porthole into the way words used to used to work and used to be used. So, uh, so I love it. So in his entry for Parade, it's lumped in with ostentation and show. Oh. So 
So he says, quote, Parade is, like show, essentially external. As ostentation is a parade of virtues or other qualities, so parade is ostentation of anything calculated to impress the minds of others in relation to one's own capacities, powers, possessions, or superiority and excellences of any kind. Parade is not only ostentatious, but continuous and complex show, seeking to produce its effect by many objects and not only one. Parade is formal, artificial, and studied show of what is intended to captivate the eye or the understanding. When, views, when one views the subject in a moral point of view, parade designates rather the action and the purpose of it, ostentation, the principle or cause of the action, and the way of doing it. One makes a parade of a thing, not an ostentation of it. One does a thing with ostentation, and for the sake of parade, it is ostentation that makes a parade of things. What is it about Smith that just makes me want to applaud <laughs> every know. time you finish reading one of his definitions? Yeah, I, I, I just, don't know, but it's really awesome. It's like it's a combination between spontaneous applause and ah, yeah, just, it's just it's a warm bath for the word nerd soul. Yeah, it really is. It's fantastic. So that's so great. That, that's that's super cool. I like that a lot. Yeah. So yeah, that's um. There's parade. Parade. Ah, oh, just. And beautiful. I do love a parade. I, uh, I, I don't know. Like I, I kind of have mixed feelings about parades themselves. Um, it, oh, I always think I've never really been in one. I don't like not that I can mm. particularly recall. Um, and it always strikes me as something that's probably much less fun for the people involved. Oh, for the people 100%. watching, like I always feel like there, there there must be a lot of a lot of queuing, which I'm not that I'm not that much of a fan of. A lot of waiting, which I detest. Right. Probably it's not always that warm, which I, like, I really I'm I'm out at this stage. But um, <laughs> but they they do look very good fun, and I'm not mad on crowds. But right. uh, but you know the the, <laughs> so, the notion of. So every possible aspect mm. is detestable to you. Well, what, what I was... <laughs> what, what I'm actually thinking is there does tend to be a lot of good snacks around. <laughs> People are like, there's going to be a fuck ton of humans. Let's sell them sugary goods. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I do like those. So, you know... Ladies and gentlemen, Amy's hierarchy of needs. <laughs> I hate I hate cues. I hate waiting. And waiting to watch a parade is queuing up to watch a queue of something go by for no reason. And it was no cold. End goal. Fuck that shit. And now I'm cold and surrounded by people, all of whom I hate by default. But snacks. Sugary goods. I'm, I'm maybe yep. I'm back in. I don't I don't hate people wholesale. That's that's entirely no, no, incorrect, that's... but God, crowds of people are pretty terrible. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think mean, it's like... fair to say I think it's this is it's time for Tommy Lee Jones' wisdom from the original Men in Black movie where he says Will Smith says, People are smart and Tommy Lee Jones goes, No, a person can be smart, <laughs> good, intelligent, rational. People people are dumb and irrational and panicky and crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If the great uh, if the great plague taught us anything, I think it's that. Yeah. Pretty much. Also, the zombie so, movies really need to start with more people just running towards the zombies, being like, "Haha, suckers!" <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, my word today. <laughs> yes. Again, I'm I'm just having a little gleeful delighted giggle to myself because once again oh, awesome like title <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, my word is cheesemonger oh that's so perfect <laughs> also cheesemonger, parade. cheesemonger like the the monger is one of the all-time great suffixes it, it, it just throughout time and space there's hold there may on. Be nothing more pleasing hold on to your nerdy hat it's all <gasps> okay. i'm gonna say about that okay, okay i'm excited go so obviously this is a compound word. It takes um, cheese, which I mean, I am a fan of cheese. Generally, yeah. generally speaking, I, I was a. I saw a friend of mine today who 
we were both recently invited by another friend, invited round to our house for cheese and booze. And my friend oh. has has got a gig on, the, he's possibly going to a gig on the same night, but it's in another city. It's kind of a bit of a pain to get there. And he was like, I mean, the alternative is I could just like have cheese and booze. And that does seem quite nice. And I pointed out that he probably shouldn't start comparing things in his life to cheese and booze like on the regular because <laughs> not that many things are going to beat that. No. Like, will I go to work or should I have cheese and booze? You know, that is a slippery slope. Oh, That's all I'm the saying. the slipperiest. So, um, cheese, the word that, 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 we, that we start off with, the thing being okay. mongered. <laughs> um, has a has a, a fairly straightforward fairly straightforward etymology. Okay. Um, the OED states that it's it's cognate with old Frisian Z's. What what I like best what? about the etymology of cheese is all the the variant spellings of what's essentially <clears throat> the same word uh, in the same sort of way, but um, but it, it just looks like somebody thought how many ways can we spell this word? Um, right. <laughs> so, um, hold on, I've lost my, there, this is what I'm looking at. So, cognate with Old Frisian Z's, that's Z-I-S-E, or West Frisian T-S-I-I-S, which totally makes cheese when you think about it. Yeah. Uh, Middle Dutch yeah. K's, C-A-S-E, K's, okay. K-E-S-E. Uh, which, you know, the, the, the German word Käse, uh, you know, the modern German word Käse, it means means cheese. And it comes from classical Latin Cassius, which is of unknown origin. So ultimately, cheese goes back to an, an unknown origin, which doesn't really surprise me all that much, because here is my favourite fact about cheese. Okay. Human beings have been eating cheese for longer in their history than the enzyme which allows human beings to digest cheese has existed. <laughs> so, so hang on, hold on a second. Yeah, 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 T take a minute. <laughs> so, so lactose intolerant people saying, you know what, this murders me, but it's worth it. Fuck it. Three dates. <laughs> every other kind of person yeah yeah that's that's how that goes <laughs> the original cheese was so good a priori <laughs> that we evolved lactose tolerance in response to our unmitigated desire for consumption of same yeah pretty much oh it's the greatest fact ever it's it's a uh... It came to me from as you know, if if you do if you like random factoids, then no such thing as a fish is a pretty great place to, to go. Oh, but, yes. Um, no such thing as a fish is is the the source of well, it's the source of me learning that that fact, um, and it, it just yeah, it made me laugh so much because oh, that's yeah, amazing. as you say, like oh, this stuff really ruins us, but it's so good. <laughs> <laughs> You know, that, that really appeals to me um, oh, on a, a cellular level. The the yes. other cool thing about cheese is that within the wonderful world of gut bacteria, yeah. there is a class of bacteria that lives in human guts called casomorphins. Now, the <laughs> caso part, as Latin casius that gives us cheese, refers, you know, it's, it's the same, um, it's a cognate. And the morphine part is, as it sounds, to do with uh, morphia. Basically, these are bacteria that, um, well, there are bacteria that release casomorphins, which are chemical compounds that make us feel happy and safe and good when we eat cheese. <laughs> So for those of you thinking right now, oh, cheese is so great, it's just the ultimate comfort food, your gut bacteria agree. Not only <laughs> that, but you don't even have to eat cheese for casomorphins to be released into your bloodstream. You can just see a picture of it or think oh. about it. And these, basically, it's like your, your gut on drugs. And what these drugs do is they really make you want to eat cheese. 
They're like, get the cheese, eat the cheese. It's good. <laughs> it will make you feel good. Cheese is a drug. <laughs> we have we have within us organisms that convert cheese directly to heroin. I mean, that's that's quite an oversimplification, but but basically, yeah. Super. <laughs> So, cheese itself in the OED, when do you think the first citation of the word cheese uh, comes? What, what, what would your guess I'm gonna, be? I'm, I'm going to guess that, but I have a question before we move on. The, the Latin Cassius? Yeah. Tell me that's like the same, like that Brutus and Cassius, like Gaius Cassius, the famous senator, like his name is just cheese? I'm afraid not. Unfortunately, <sighs> that, that would be extremely pleasing. It's C-A-S-E-U-S and Cassius <sighs> as a yeah, Brutus is double, double S. -S. Yeah. Okay, that's um, too bad. Okay, so, but so, I, had to get, I had to get that. Oh, know. absolutely, yeah. I, I'd think badly if you if, if you didn't. So, um, so uh, I would... casein is the protein, that, one of the proteins that's found in, in dairy. So there are lots of right. other case words. That, that relate to, to dairy products and specifically to cheese. Right. Um, okay. So, uh, w so when is when is cheese so first being I, written I mean, about? I, I would have... It, it's got to be... Well, if it's related to Latin... I'm, well, here's what I'm hoping. I, I'm thinking that cheese is probably kind of, I would say, one of the earliest Latin things to come in. So I'm going to say like maybe 1300s. But what I really want is I want this to be one of these examples that I was uh, pondering the the possibility of where it's a Latin word that actually stuck around since when the Romans were in Britain and withstood the Anglo-Saxon period to come back into English. So I'm going to say either 1300 or like 300. <laughs> Your, your reasoning is, is fairly sound because I had to do a little date check to myself because the first citation isn't actually dated beyond it being labelled as Early Old English. <gasps> now, um, Early Old That's English like 600. Doesn't, doesn't come up all that often. So I, I checked. You, you can do this in the OED. Um, there, there are very clear guidelines about it. So just, just a little refresher. The dating system for Old English quotations that's cited in the OED currently, um, it says, individual dating of Old English quotations has itself been abandoned and replaced by a simple threefold division of all pre-1150 quotations into Early Old English, that's between 600 and 950, Old English between 950 and 1100 and late Old English from 1100 to 1150 based firmly on manuscript dates as agreed by the most recent authorities. Uh, there's details of those. And it, it also says here, it should be noted that the three divisions of early Old English, Old English and late Old English adopted by the third edition of the Oxford English Dictionary are equal neither in span of years nor in wealth of material. By far the majority of manuscripts containing Old English that have survived belong to the period 950 to 1100. Okay. Um, okay. But cheese has been around forever. Is yeah. basically basically what I'm saying. If you've got a word where you have a, a written citation dating from potentially the year 600, <laughs> Cheese yeah. is, 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 is as old as as old as old as old can be, so old that we That's couldn't fantastic. even digest it. God damn it! And <laughs> I I didn't have time to look at them all, but man, there are so many compound cheese words, both <laughs> contained within the the definition, uh, the, the the cheese definition, and um, within you know that that have individual definitions of their own. There's just there's hundreds of them. Absolutely hundreds of them. And some of them are really, really pleasant and hilarious. Um, cheese Room, for example. I'm like, oh, I need to get me one of those. Yeah. And what made me laugh a little while you were discussing your word earlier, of course, cheese pairing. Cheese is a thing that can be paired. Right, yeah. And um, cheese pairing is also a word that's used to describe someone who's miserly or mean. Um, oh. Because they don't give you chunks of cheese, they give you little thin slices. Again, very much fits in with what you were saying about the idea that pairing is about the thing that you cut thin mm. slices of rather than the block that you cut it from. However, yeah. let's get on to the part that, that we're all really interested in because the, the reason that I'm talking about this word in the first place is because last weekend, um, a, a delightful occasion, um, recently it was my husband's birthday, 
and his parents, my lovely in-laws, got him a voucher for a really nice cheese shop not far from where we live. Nice. And it was basically like being given a voucher for entry into the middle classes. <laughs> we, went to, we went to the artisanal cheese shop. We bought a selection of artisanal cheese, cheeses, a sourdough baguette and a small selection of chutneys. Oh. <laughs> then we came home and ate them all. However, because I am Money not can't middle buy class, happiness, my ass. I know exactly. Because I am not middle class, I finished up with like Coca Cola and dodgy sweeties because <laughs> that's who I really am. Excellent. Um, but it, it was it was very very it was very nice, very lovely. We had a really nice gouda with cumin seeds in it. Nice. That was delicious. A brie that just tasted like all the good things in the world. Yeah. And a, a cheese, I can't remember the name of it, but it had a rind that was soaked in red wine. And oh, yeah. It just, it, like, if there's anything about that situation that doesn't make you super happy, like, are we even friends? <laughs> That's right. I know that there are people out there who choose not to eat cheese, but yep. but I just can't understand why. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a lot of trouble wrapping my head around it. And so as we were driving home from the, the delicious, delicious shop, we had a conversation, my husband and I, about the word, about the, 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 the suffix munger. And I said, yeah. you know, that why aren't there more mongers around? And, and we, we were thinking about it. We were like, well, you know, you get iron munger and cheese munger. Okay. And really, you know, not that Fish many other... Fishmonger, Fish and that, war yeah. come to mind. Warmonger. Yeah, and that, that, that was about it. We couldn't really come up with, with very many more. Now, yeah. in the, the Wiktionary entry for this word, um, there's, a, there's a short list of derived terms, um, which <laughs> don't include those obvious ones at all, but, but, we're, uh, but we're quite, quite lovely. There's actually, there's, there's a ton. Um, so we have um, alemonger, Someone nice. that I'd be interested in getting to know better. Yeah. Apple monger, ballad monger, uh, butter monger, law monger, nice. rumor monger, gossip monger. That's what that one's pretty, uh, pretty well known. Sleaze monger and smut monger. <laughs> we have, of course, war monger, <laughs> water monger, twaddle oh. monger. Uh, sorry, what? That, that was good. Twaddle monger. Twaddle monger. Tw twaddle. That's awesome. Uh, whoremonger. Yep. And and pretty much everything in between. Garlic monger, wow. miracle monger. There's oh. a mongress, as in a female monger. <laughs> and yeah. um, just all, all sorts. It's it's quite a it's quite a lovely uh, quite a lovely list to, to kind of work your way through and, and have a little laugh at. But this isn't really the suffix in, in particular common usage and and i kind of wondered no. why that was so i decided i would look it up and here here we are it did turn out to be an interesting word to look at so um it's derived sorry before i get to that it's it's uh, it's definition in the oed is given as a merchant trader dealer or trafficker frequently of a specified commodity okay okay and again take a guess when's this word uh, first first written down Hmm. Monger. Quite difficult uh, to put to put a Yeah. Fourteen hundreds? Early old English. Wow. Once again. People have been I mongering. I might be late, but not that late. Uh, people have been mongering for a long, long time. Yeah. Now in, in terms of its etymology, OED gives this cognate with or form similarly to Old Saxon Mongari, Old High German Mangari. Mangari, Old Icelandic Mangari, and all of these words, it's believed, are pr they probably come directly from the classical Latin word mango, spelled the same as the delicious fruit, but with no, mm -hmm. with no relation. And mm. in fact, mango has its own entry in the, the the Oxford English Dictionary. So, while it's obsolete and rare, in the 17th century, uh, a mango, in classical Latin, it simply means dealer. Hmm. But in 17th century English, it meant a dealer in slaves, especially prostitutes. Hmm. And it's, it's such a, a pleasing little word for such a grim uh, description of, of a trade. Yeah. 
Jeez. Yeah, that, that was that was kind of my thinking. So it's from classical Latin mangere, um, which I believe can also mean to make, but um, through its these these various Germanic roots, um, it, it's we get we get munger and words like it. There's also there's there's a, a theory or a thought that it may be related to a Greek word, which means to make something look desirable, to kind of polish something up a bit. Um, although that th th there seems to be some some doubt about whether or not this uh, Greek um, this this Greek word is is in fact cognate. But it does make sense that someone who deals in selling a thing, you know, wants it to, to be set out well and, and looked looked after and, you know, make it look as good as it can. Interestingly, the OED definition notes that from the 16th century, a monger of anything was a person engaged in a petty or disreputable trade or traffic. And this sort of goes some way to answering my question. Why aren't there more mongers? Well, because by the 16th century, a monger was, was dodgy in some way. Mm. They were selling something that, was, uh, that, that, that wasn't great. So um, Etym Online has this, this really, really delightful little uh, side note. Um, the, the quotation given is from... Thomas Wright's Anglo-Saxon and Old English Vocabularies, 1884. Um, and it says in 1884, it is a curious instance of the degradation through which words go, that what was in the Saxon period, the designation for the most elevated description of merchant, Mangeri, is now only a term for small dealers and principally in petty wares, monger. So hmm. in 1884, Thomas Wright was bemoaning the fact that, that not bemoaning, but he was commenting on the, the yeah. fact that, that words change in meaning. So rather than someone who is a, you know, a, a merchant who were rather well-to-do, respectable people within uh, certainly medieval society, pre-medieval society, and, and after that, um, a monger became someone who had that, th there was that sense in Etym Online, it says there's overtones of being petty and disreputable. So, um, hmm. yeah, so so a cheesemonger, well, my private theory, and again, I'm going to put my R and jumper on here too. My private theory is that it doesn't matter if cheese is disreputable. People don't care. They're going to eat it anyway. They're going to buy it anywhere. And they're going to buy it from the guy who's called whatever the hell the guy is called. Yeah, it doesn't matter. So that's that's true. And all the other things that, that the mongers decided to perhaps rebrand themselves around, cheesemongers yeah. just didn't have to bother doing that because cheese nope. is awesome. Th yeah, those are it sells, yeah. Those are my thoughts, basically. I wonder if now that I mean again, I'm going full folk etymology, folk history on this, but basically I I wonder because you were saying that monger always meant um, a particular a merchant of a particular thing, like a specialized merchant. Th that does seem to be the case. Although, in, at least in the earliest. The, although mangeri just means a dealer. However, it seems to me that when it passed right. into usage in English, certainly, um, it, it was a dealer of a of a thing. Yeah, as you say. Mm. I just I wondered about the the timing that by the eighteen hundreds it had become. Uh, a petty and disreputable merchant as opposed to someone of upper class. And I, I just, my first thought was, I wonder if the sort of Renaissance period appreciation of a multifaceted, like if you only did one thing, you weren't a Renaissance man. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder if there was an attitude of kind of um, dismissal towards specialists as opposed to generalists. And maybe that mm. contributed to it. I don't know that. That is an interesting question to ask. Um, however, the the word cheesemonger has its own definition, its own entry in the Oxford English Dictionary. Oh, fabulous! Despite the fact that both the word cheese and the word monger existed for for you know a very very long time, early Old English. The right. first citation given of the word cheesemonger itself is eleven eighty five or perhaps eleven eighty six. Baldwin okay. Le Cheese Mangere, which is spelled delightfully C H E S E M A N G E R A. Cheese Mangere. Nice. 
so um again a, a very you know a very old word however there is this really lovely point to be made about uh, about the word cheesemonger Etym etymologically speaking of course we've we've kind of covered the covered the idea that, that this is what's going on um i tried chasing i tried tracing uh, mangare and mango back th uh, one of the entries that i read said that there was a an idea that the proto there was a proto indo-european root that had some relation to the the idea of deception and this is of course related to this idea of the the greek word manganon which means to sort of adorn your wares to make them look better um so this this kind of fits with the idea of deception but neither the university of austin at university of texas at austin pokorny language etymon index i don't even know if those words made any sense in the right order whatever <laughs> uh, nor the american heritage dictionary uh index of pirates had any roots that that seemed to relate to that the right. university of texas pokorny index had ma as a, a prefix in pi but didn't mm. give any further information about it other than that it existed um oh. so I, and may have meant something to do with deception so I, I i hit a bit of a dead end with that right um anyway sorry cheesemonger itself has this has this really interesting little note because there are in fact two senses given there's oh. the first one the one that we've been talking about which is first cited in 1185 and the citations go right up to 2014. A person who sells or deals in cheese, and that meaning has stayed stable throughout all of those intervening centuries. However, in plural, the cheesemongers was also a historical nickname given to the first lifeguards. Now, the what? first, the brackets, first, close brackets, lifeguards. Now, okay. this is an, an interesting little side alley um, the term lifeguard originally meant a bodyguard of soldiers. It was oh. literally a group of people who guarded one's life. Now, the, the first definition given of the noun lifeguard is a bodyguard of soldiers, in modern use and plural, inform lifeguards, so two separate words, the senior cavalry regiment of the British Army, now with the Blues and Royals, part of the household cavalries. And they give a quick note to say the first and second lifeguards regiments were formed in 1788 from the horse grenadier guards and four troops of the king's horse guards. In 1922, the two regiments merged and in 1992 joined with the Royal Horse Guards and the first Dragoon Guards, the Blues and Royals, to form the Household Cavalry. So this nickname, the Cheesemongers, refers to a regiment of of. The, the British Army, the Armed Forces. Hmm. They were called the Cheesemongers. So this citation is given from 1824. And the European magazine in London Review says, His Majesty's lifeguards, satirically called the Cheesemongers, real weighty and most responsible citizens, boldly bumped along by his side. Now, the, uh, <laughs> the note that's given, however, is okay. from... 1788. Sense two is said to have arisen in the late 18th century, with allusion to the fact that many officers of first lifeguards at the time came from the merchant or trading classes. Compare the following. Now this comes from 1788 and it's from Frederick the Duke of York's letters. Um, he's corresponding with Charles First Marcus Con Cornwallis and um, the letter says... I have no doubt that your lordship will not regret the reduction of the four troops of horse guards and horse grenadiers, as they were the most useless and the most unmilitary troops that ever were seen. I confess that I was a little sorry for the horse grenadiers, because they were to a degree soldiers, but the horse guards were nothing but a collection of London tradespeople. Mm. So this oh, and the the slightly snooty uh, uh, eighteen twenty four citation that's given 
the word weighty is is italicised. I don't know if they're basically saying this regiment was made up of fat, <laughs> useless merchants who had eaten too much cheese uh, and uh, had no more responsibility in the real world than selling cheese. But no one seems to have had uh, a particularly good uh, opinion of the military cheesemongers. However, wow. I remain very much a devoted fan of the the first definition of cheesemonger. Anyone that can get me the sweet, sweet drug of cheese is all right by me. <laughs> and can you even imagine how happy and instantaneously willing you would be to wade through a thick crowd to stand in a queue to watch another queue go by as long as that was part of a cheesemonger parade? <laughs> And that's it for another episode of Lexitecture. To get in touch with us about something you heard in this episode, you can email us at words at lexitecture.com. You can also follow along and talk to us at Lexitecture on Facebook and Twitter and at Lexitecture Podcast on Instagram. For back episodes and the occasional blog post, visit us at lexitecture.com. Thanks very much, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you.